All right. I think we are live as of right now. Um, so I'm just going to mention a quick hello to everyone from uh, Montreal for myself. It is a pleasure to, uh, to start the day with you guys. I see a lot of you know, uh, com coming through. And as always, it's always fun to see where everybody's logging in from uh, worldwide attendance so far. It's, it's really been great. And um, a, a quick comment for everybody. I, I've seen a lot of activity on LinkedIn over the last couple of days as we enter into day four. So just a really great appreciation for everybody that is commenting. We continue to have people register for TMF Week as we go through, which is uh, really a testament to the speakers uh, and the content that's being delivered, which makes me so excited to introduce our next session. So as an official welcome to day four, uh, today's session, um, let me just power up here so that you guys see what we're going to be tackling today. And so uh, today's session, we're going to be uh, inviting uh, two speakers to, uh, to join us today. And of course, the session today is titled How to Avoid Last Minute Inspection Chaos, Periodic Review of the TMF. And so of course, my name is Michael Pupil. I'm the head of sales at Montreal. Um, if uh, this is your first session, welcome. We'll cover a little bit of housekeeping. If this is uh, numerous sessions, apology for some of the repetition, but we certainly want to encourage, um, you know, the, the housekeeping pieces, which is, um, you know, our QA session. We highly encourage any of the questions that you guys have to be included into the chat. Uh, we're going to try to tackle as many of those questions as we can towards the end of the presentation from our two speakers today. And then, of course, this session is going to be recorded and available to the rest of the group. As this is the first session of the day, there are certainly a number of networking uh, opportunities in between our uh, sessions. And so we highly encourage you to take a couple of minutes just to say hi to those that have been powering TMF Week, as well as those that are also in attendance. So to uh, change over now to introduce our two terrific speakers and, and wonderful people, uh, Don Nickham and Richard Golden. Uh, Don is an expert uh, in the development and implementation of clinical trial systems as a subject matter expert uh, and member of the TMF Reference Model Group. Uh, as a current ambassador of the Metrics Champion Consortium, the MCC, Don has participated in work groups for TMF, study quality, and centralized monitoring. Uh, she has presented as an SME at a numerous conferences on clinical quality systems and inspection readiness, not to mention she has done uh, just a few of, uh, of our sessions with Montrim as well, and so we hold on pretty dear to our heart. Uh, she holds a master's degree in regulatory affairs, quality control, and certifications in clinical research, GCP quality assurance, and project management. So welcome, Don, and welcome again. Um, alongside her is Richard. Richard currently serves as the manager of TMF operations at Inception Group. Uh, based in Lansdale, Pennsylvania. At Inception, Richard provides comprehensive TMF support to small and mid medium-sized sponsors using VivaVault. Richard has previously worked with a global sponsor responsible for TMF analytics and milestone-based document management. Richard has specialized in two areas, periodic review of the TMF and reconciliation of the IRB, IEC submission and approvals. So with that, it gives me really great pleasure to hand it over to the two of you uh, today, Don, and what I'll do is I will stop sharing so that you can bring up your screen as well. Fantastic. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you. We would, we would um, Richard and I would like to uh, thank Montreal, of course, for our hosting this wonderful week, and we're really excited to, to be here. I'm excited to kick off day four as um, if you were there on Monday, you know I am a member of the advisory board and this is the day that's near and dear to my heart. Um, because I'm QA, um, when we start talking standards and regulations and inspections, uh, I, I start getting excited because at the end of the day, that's what we need to adhere to. So I hope you're able to attend um, several of the sessions today. Just a little bit about we go. A little bit about Inception Group. Um, we are an outsourcing provider and um, we work with um, lots of different small and mid-side sponsors and some large sponsors as well to provide all these services on, on here and if anyone would like to talk to me about that 
feel free to drop me a line. Um, certainly after the session, I want to reiterate what, what Mike said is that we will um, be in the networking lounge. So let's have a great discussion. We do want to keep this very interactive throughout the presentation. So um, we're, we're looking forward to your questions. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand over to Richard, start talking about periodic review. Uh, th thank you so much, Dawn, and thank you, Mike, for your uh, wonderful introduction, and thanks to all of you for being here, and thanks to Botrium for extending the invitation for us to speak today. Uh, the topic today is, what is periodic review? Um, it's a term that has gained a lot of currency in the last few years um, as, you know, sponsors, uh, CROs, vendors are starting to pay more attention to evaluating the accuracy and completeness of the TMF during the course of the study. Uh, historically, you, we've seen a lot of instances where people wait until it's time for archiving or wait until it's time for inspection, and then there's a mad scramble to, you know, check the TMF for accuracy and completeness, and it oftentimes can cause a lot of issues uh, for those who are directly involved in TMF management and implementation because you may have gone sometimes months or even years without looking at the documents that are uploaded and also checking to see what, what's missing. So to the basic question, what is periodic review? It's simply an in-stream review of the TMF for completeness and accuracy. Some study teams may make the mistake of waiting until archiving or inspection for any comprehensive review. By that, it may be too late. And some examples are the types of uh, findings that you may have in a periodic review. Uh, these are some things that I've seen personally uh, that may come up a lot, and I'm sure some of you can relate to them. The protocol signature page and the protocol amendment signature page are uploaded in incorrect artifacts, so those two are inverted. Um, one, you know, the protocol page is at 523 when it should be at 522, and the amendment signature page is at 522 when it should be at 523. Those are the types of common errors that you'll see, um, you know, at the site level, and a periodic review will help you um, identify and remediate those types of errors. Um, other common examples, document dates or version numbers are incorrect. Uh, again, those, a lot of times that's just a transcription errors. Uh, in the metadata, um, you know, duplicates is a big one, um, especially when you have multiple people working or with access to a TMF. It's very easy to, you know, get have duplicates uploaded. Or sometimes you could have one person who works on a TMF, but it's a very long-term study, and they may be getting documents from different sources. And for whatever reason, you know, they may have uploaded a document, you know, at 2019. And then that document gets sent again, you know, a year or two later because there was another, um, you know, came out of a repository or came from a different source. So the bottom line is that duplicates exist in our systems and periodic review is a way to root them out. Um, another one that um, I had quite a bit of experience in uh, over the last couple of years ago, uh, if there's an IRB approval, there should be a corresponding IRB submission. Um, you know, now, of course, for those of you who use central IRBs in the United States, you know, all your sites may not have the submission documents because they don't, they're not privy to them, they just have the approvals. But in many other instances, you know, local IRBs or in other countries, the IRB approvals, you know, have to match the submissions. And that can be, you know, a, a major fine um, in an inspection because, you know, an inspector can say, okay, I see 10 approvals and I only see four submissions. So, you know, where are they? And vice versa, you could have too many submissions and not enough approvals. So that's another example. Being a document has been QC rejected by a third party for poor scanning, orientation, pagination, or has not been remediated. So, you know, some of you may have situations where you, you know, farm out the QC of your uh, documents and the, Issues with, you know, good documentation practice are identified, but they haven't been remediated. So 
you know, nobody wants to get to the end of a study or to inspection and find out, oh, we've got hundreds of documents that were identified as having some type of issue and nothing's been done. So the periodic review process, again, allows you in stream to identify and remediate those issues as they, as they arise. Um, another one, you know, this is particular to sponsors. Some of you, uh, you know, may have your own TMF, but then you have certain documents that are held by a CRO. Uh, you know, maybe data management or statistics or maybe sometimes site management. And then those documents are transferred in bulk, you know, at the end of a study or maybe at a milestone. And, you know, you may have a situation where you're given literally thousands of documents at one time and you want to ensure that those documents have been properly reviewed, they've been uploaded correctly, the metadata is correct, and the documents are what they purport to be um, once they're in the system. So, um, like I say, for sponsors, that can be a big issue when you're expecting bulk uploads from uh, a CRO. Okay, uh, if we can move to the next slide. Then. Um, All right, so, so we actually have a poll that we wanted to throw up. Um, you know, understanding what periodic review is. And Mike, if you'll go ahead and launch that poll for me. Um, do you or your vendor have an established periodic review process? So, you know, pretty simple here. Is it yes, we do, no, we don't, or we're just not even sure? We'll give a few minutes for people to go. Still have a few responses coming in. It's nice to see these taking the lead versus the other. Yep. Yeah. I still see a few coming in. Looks like we're so why don't we go ahead? So why don't we go ahead and end that that poll right now? There we go. We'll go ahead and publish it so everybody can see it in the polls. Um, yeah, so 77% yes and 23% and or so no. Um, great. Well, for those 23%, we're going to give you some more reasons of why you might want to do this. So I'm going to let Richard continue. If my slides will advance. There we go. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dawn. And uh, it's good to hear that a overwhelming percentage of you already have some uh, periodic review process in place. And, and, and like Dawn said, you know, for those of you who do not have an established process, um, some of the reasons um, that we, you know, it's so important are based on the Alcala principles. And so the periodic review process is designed to ensure that documents uploaded in the TMF meet these standard principles that we're all aware of. You know, they're attributable, legible, contemporaneous, original, accurate, complete, consistent, enduring, and available. And so this is sort of our baseline of, you know, principles underlying TMF maintenance and management. And, you know, it's so important for us not, again, not to wait until you have archiving or inspection. So it's, you know, the, the, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel with periodic review. Um, there isn't some kind of magic fairy dust or some kind of quantum mechanics involved. You're simply taking the baseline principles from which you started the TMF in the first place and ensuring on a periodic basis that, you know, those principles are being upheld in your documentation. And we'll, you know, shortly get to uh, what time periods uh, or could be available to you. Um, if we can move to the next slide. So when does periodic review take place? Um, at a minimum, uh, it's probably a good rule of thumb that review should be conducted at each milestone. Um, I know we all have different terminologies for our milestones. Um, you know, some suggestions here, first subject, first visit last subject, last visit, database freeze slash lock, study close, archiving. Um, so we would think that, you know, you're gonna have at least 
five periodic reviews or maybe even more uh, depending on what type of system you set up. But we think that five is enough because if you figure that an average study lasts somewhere in the two to three year range, that gives you, uh, you're looking at the, the, at the study for a review at least two to three times a year, okay? Any alternative teams can undertake review at set intervals unrelated to milestone attainment. For example, monthly, quarterly, uh, every six months, or even annually. Uh, I'm not sure. I would suggest going annually unless you have a very small study. Um, yeah, it needs to be done a little bit more often, uh, you know, given the volume of documents that you have. Okay. Uh, if you are using a milestone approach, you may choose to review only those artifacts that were expected for that milestone. So, for example, if you're doing a first subject versus a milestone, you could say, okay, we expected CVs, 1572s, financial disclosures, protocols, ICFs, and those other, uh, you know, quote, unquote, greed-like documents, um, you know, the ones that are required to get the sites up and running, um, you know, feasibility, documentation. So, you know, you could choose just to look at those particular documents. And the reason I say that is because, you know, we're not going to, depending on the volume of your study, you're not going to look at every single document, open it, and then review it. Um, hopefully, you've had enough, your processes of initial uploading and QCing are strong enough that you don't have a lot of findings. Um, so that's why it's good to, you know, take a representative sampling of the types of documents you're going to be reviewing. Um, any alternative, uh, you may choose to review any and all documents that were uploaded during a time frame between milestones. So, for example, um, you know, we're looking at all documents that were uploaded between FSFV and LSLV, regardless of when those documents were expected. Um, because what can happen is you may get documents that were expected at study closeout. You get them early and you wait until study close out to look at them, it turns out there may be some issues and you don't want to do that. So there's no reason for you to wait until, you know, study close out to look at documents, you know, set for that bio. So just because that's the way they're designated, if you get them early, there's no reason you can't review them early. We can move to the next slide, Don. Okay, so we're going to do another poll. Um, with this slide, and this time we want you to answer, you know, how often are you doing your reviews? So is it monthly, quarterly, every milestone, only once at the end of the study, once or twice a year, as soon as an inspection is scheduled, and be honest with these, um, or you just not are not sure. So we're starting to get them in there. Um, I do see a few coming through as every inspection is scheduled. Yeah. And I can tell you just anecdotally, I, I actually have a client that I'm working with right now. They um, just had an FDA inspection announced. Um, it's going to happen in the next week. And they didn't pay attention to one of their TMFs and now they're panicking. And, you know, so if you wait until the inspection happens for the periodic review, it, it's, it's probably gonna, it gonna hit you. So looks like we've, we're, well, we're kind of getting there. We'll give it one couple more seconds, then we'll go ahead and close the poll. Okay, let's go ahead and end that. We'll show the result. Great, so we had 47% were monthly, quarterly. Very common, we do have about 18% that do it at milestone basis. Um, there are 8% that are only, or 7.4 that are doing it only at the end, once or twice a year, 22%. And as Richard mentioned, once or twice a year, depending on your studies and the cadence of them, that might be still okay. Um, waiting till the inspection, I'm sure you have some war stories that you can tell us on, on what's happened with that. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll let, let's talk about who's responsible. Uh, yes, and um, be before we get to that, I wanted to follow up uh, Dawn's comments with the anecdote of my own. Um, I had heard a story a few years ago where a 
inspector came in and looked at the TMF, some fairly large studies, and he was looking at the audit trails. And he noticed that there were hundreds or maybe even thousands of documents that had either been uploaded for the first time or modified within the previous two to three weeks before the inspection. Um, so as you can imagine, that was a fairly significant finding, and it was indicative of the fact that the you know, people responsible for the TMF, the study teams or specialists or whoever it was, um, had not been doing any type of periodic review. And so, you know, they get a call, okay, inspection's coming, and then there was a mad scramble to go backwards and fix all these documents. And I think regardless of what systems you use, there's going to be audit trails uh, telling us, telling an inspector or auditor that, you know, when documents were recently modified or uploaded. So, yeah, it's uh, another, uh, you know, cautionary tale about the importance of doing a periodic review. Okay. Um, as to who was responsible, there's, there could be a couple different scenarios. Um, you know, every sponsor is different, every CRO is different, you know, every outsourcing vendor. So there's no hard and fast rule, but these are just a couple suggestions we have from past experience. Um, in scenario one, study team members upload their own documents into the TMF. In this case, study team members are responsible for reviewing documents that they own with technical assistance and support from a TMF specialist. So, you know, an example would be to, in a functional area, like say, for example, data management. If the people in data management, um, you know, uploaded the documents, they're going to be the ones who are going to do the review to ensure accuracy and completeness. Now, obviously, they're not going to know necessarily know all the intricacies of the TMF and you know wh where these are supposed to be and you know have all the metadata and how they should be filed. So that's where the technical assistance piece comes in from your specialists. Now that that's just one option. Scenario two is a TMF specialist who's not part of a functional area. You know uploads all documents into the TMF, and in that case, the specialist is responsible for the periodic review and then may or may or may not reach out to study team members for clarifications and or corrections to individual documents. Um, I would imagine many of you who are using, you know, CRO um, operated TMFs are probably in scenario two. So it's really important that there be that, you know, collaboration and cooperation between the CRO or outsourcing vendor and the sponsor you know, during the periodic review process to make sure that, you know, where there's full adherence to the Alcoa CCA principles. Okay, if we could uh, move to the next slide. What documents to include? Um, this sort of uh, dovetails with the discussion earlier on when periodic review should occur, you know, because there we talked about, you know, if you're at a certain milestone, you may pick documents related to that milestone. Um, but, you know, there again, there's no hard and fast rule. We're just speaking generally from experience. Um, one approach is sort of what I call the essential document approach. Um, because again, you make your problem, depending on the size of, and volume of your study, you're not necessarily going to review every single document, open it and, and check it. So, but essential documents, you know, at the central trial level, it put a study reference manual, protocol, investigator brochure, lab manual, clinical study report, uh, some of the essential documents at the country level, um, protocol, a uh, little translation of a protocol, I should say, um, ICFs, diaries, questionnaires, of course, regulatory submission and approvals, um, reporting analysis plan um, is something usually at the study level. Um, site and center level, uh, protocol signature page, uh, 1572s, signature sheets, um, IP, dispensing, return to structure sheets, CVs. Uh, this list is by no means exhaustive. Um, it's not meant to be, okay, these are the, you know, the only essential documents that can be subject to review. These are just purely suggestions. Okay. Um, and then uh, teams can take different approaches. Uh, you could choose identify documents associated with a major event that occurred during a study. So for example, uh, we call it follow a thread. 
So if you have a protocol amendment, there's a thread. Following a thread means there are certain documents associated with the protocol amendment that need to be, that should be filed, and you can check those for completeness and accuracy. So if, uh, with the amendment, you have the amendment itself, you have the IRB approval, you have uh, the signature pages from your sites, and you, you're going to have new ICFs related to that. Okay, um, in some cases you may have, you know, the new checklist um, or a new uh, summary of changes, you know, whatever it may be. But the idea is that you're looking to, uh, to examine all documents related to that particular event. Um, other examples of events may be if there's a new principal investigator or a new sub investigator. So obviously you'd have a new CV. Um, you'd have an updated 1572. You need new financial disclosure forms. Um, you need to, you know, find out if that person has a GCP training, and of course, you know, your IRB approvals, um, you know, or in some cases, maybe some countries might have a regulatory approval for, you know, a new uh, sub I or PI. But the idea is that, you know, all the documents associated with a change in PI or sub I are all accurate and complete. Um, other examples, uh, sort of lumped in together, protocol deviations or safety events. Obviously, you're going to have your PD logs and, of course, your, you know, report of safety information to either regulatory authorities uh, or the IRB or both, you know, depending on the country. Uh, you may have scions associated with it. You're going to have uh, SAE report forms associated with it. Um, and there may be pregnancy forms. But the idea is that, again, if there's a protocol deviation or a safety event, you can look at all the documents associated with those particular events. Uh, to determine, um, you know, accuracy and completeness. Um, and finally, another example, uh, teams may choose to identify certain zones uh, or countries or sites. You may say, okay, our periodic review, we're, uh, number one, we're doing zones one, two, and three. The next review, we're going to do four, five, and six, and so forth down the line. Or you may have a large study with, say, 40, you know, 20 countries and the first periodic review we're going to do five countries and then we're going to do five countries after that or you may do it by sites and then you do all documents associated with the site with the country or with the zone uh, regardless of when it was uploaded or expected okay so that's just another approach uh, that we've seen from experience if we go to the next slide then. Uh, documenting the periodic review. Um, obviously, periodic review has come about, um, you know, frankly, in response to audits and or inspections, indicating that there were issues with um, oversight of and in the management and maintenance aspects of the TMF. So it's really important that an auditor inspector be able to see evidence of that oversight. So the review serves as evidence of oversight at TMF. So the documentation should be filed in Zone 111 Child Master File Plan. Uh, that documentation, again, there's no hard and fast rule. It may take the form of an Excel spreadsheet outlining each and every document that was reviewed. Um, any alternative, you just have a narrative word or PDF document that summarizes the scope of the review and the findings. Um, you know, of course, if documentation is uploaded to the TMF on a regular basis, and the auditor and inspector can certify that appropriate oversight has taken place. So there's no sense you do all this work uh, on a periodic review, and then you fail to document that you did. Because you know it's it's really important to have that evidence of oversight and understand and the knowledge that the oversight took place on a regular basis, and that it didn't happen, you know, right before inspection. And we can move to the next slide. Don, you're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> well, that would explain why nobody's answering me. Okay. <laughs> um, at 2021, if you don't say you're on mute, then you haven't had a meeting. All right. So I did want to. Um, I did want to um, answer one question because I think it goes um, around here, around the scope of periodic review. You know, as far as, you know, what do your scope or do you, do you suggest 100% periodic review or random sampling? I would say, you know, 
No, you shouldn't. I mean, you shouldn't have to do 100% because the expectation is you should have some sort of QC built into your upload process. And the idea of periodic review is more to think about, you know, checkpoints within the system to verify that things were uploaded right. Or if, if you've had changes in your process or how you name, you know, throughout a study, you know, do you do you want to align everything and make sure everything's consistent? So random sampling is is definitely the way to go. Random or targeted. So Richard did talk about, you know, hitting some targeted documents with that. Um, some people call those key document reviews. So how are we doing on our poll? Are we getting there? Yeah, I think uh, we've gotten most of the uh, respondents here, so I'll end the poll and show results. Okay, excellent. Thank you. All right, so, okay, so interesting. So we do have, you know, a percentage that do look at a certain milestone, about 13%. All documents uploaded to date. So that looks, that sounds like um, people may be doing a, a sampling or doing a 100% review. Um, again, that may or may not be possible. If you're um, doing small studies, you can do a larger review, but you know, I, we have studies that have 100,000 documents. You are obviously not gonna be able to look at all of those, not each document individually at least. Um, I do a represent sampling by a percentage, look only at essential documents, and then again, only documents related to deviations or quality issues. So, yep, absolutely. Um, interesting. So, um, we want to go to questions next. All right. All right. So we did um, we did have the question around 100% periodic review or random sampling. I think I addressed that already. Richard, did you want to address that? On do you suggest 100% periodic review or random sampling? Um, I think it really depends on the size of the study, um, as we both alluded to. Um, if you have a small study, yes, you can look at every document. Um, but when the larger the study gets, you know, obviously representative sampling, um, you know, maybe like 50% of documents or, you know, 25% of documents. One of the key issues with that is, do you want to review documents twice? you know, um, or even more times. Um, so if you were to do, you know, a percentage of all documents, regardless of when they were uploaded, then you run the risk of duplicating work. So one, you know, possible way to approach it is say, okay, we'll do a percentage of all documents that were uploaded from, say, January 1 to, you know, April 1, you know, that were uploaded in the first quarter. And then we're going to do, our next review will be all a percentage of all documents that were uploaded from April 1 to June 1, you know, second quarter, and then, you know, you do the third quarter to fourth quarter. Or if you're doing a monthly approach, you can say all documents that were uploaded, a percent, all documents or a percentage of all documents that were uploaded within the past month, um, whatever period of time you use. So that's, that avoids duplicating work. But again, you know, there's no hard and fast rule. Sure. Okay, so we have a few questions. I'm going to try to group this, group these together. Um, the how frequent periodic review should be, I think we answered that one. So we'll go ahead and get that rid of that one. Um, we have a we have a question. I thought this was kind of interesting. During an internal audit of one of our TMFs, the auditor stated functional areas aren't responsible for checking or QCing their documents, and you were you were surprised. What are your thoughts? So, you know, what, what I'm going to say to you, it's the typical um, GCP answer. It depends. You know, what does your process say? So if your process specifies that its functional area is responsible for doing some of their own reviews, then yes, they do. Um, I would say 100% anyone who submits a document should be and it should be dictated to be responsible for doing that initial QC. You know, it, it's it's kind of the uh, garbage in, garbage out piece. If we get submitted a lot of documents with issues, um, your TMF operations team is spending a lot of time remediating those. So, you know, initial, initial piece should do it. 
As far as periodic QC, it's all how you have it set up. Um, I even, and I wanted to address another piece of that, throw this over to Richard as well. Um, there was a second question related to this that, you know, who, you know, could the person who uploads be the same person who QCs be the same person who does periodic QC? You know, again, if your process dictates that, that's not wrong. I will tell you it's not ideal. And the reason it's not ideal is, you know, you, it's a forest for the trees kind of situation. If you've looked at a document or a set of documents over and over again, and you've done a, the upload and you don't have anyone else looking at it, then often you're, you're missing things because you're too familiar with it. So getting a fresh set of eyes on those documents is helpful and at least doing that on a periodic basis. So if you want to do the upload and approval, you know, straight shot, there shouldn't be, you know, that, that's okay if that's how you're doing your initial QC and your process dictates that. But I would still recommend someone else is doing periodic review. So, Richard, I don't know if you want to go ahead and address both of those questions. Yeah, um, I, I guess the, the first part about the functional area representatives, what I would probably suggest in there is that the person who uploads, makes the initial uploads from that functional area does not necessarily be the person who does a periodic review, but that person could that the person who does a periodic review should be someone else from that functional area if that makes sense so if person a in data management is doing the uploading and maybe even the initial approvals qc person b from data management who may or may not have seen these documents before should be doing a periodic review because you always have to have a you know a second set of eyes so um, one approach I've seen taken in the past is that where it doesn't matter who does the periodic review as long as it's somebody familiar with that particular area, okay? Not necessarily a person who uploaded it. Um, so that's why you would suggest you have a second person from that area who's familiar with what should be in there and, you know, if there's any issues with those documents. Um, as to the second part, um, I can't imagine any scenario where the person who uploads uh, does their own QC, does their own approval, and then does periodic review. It's all one person. Um, at some point in that chain, you need a second or even third set of eyes. Um, so, yeah, I, I would always suggest that there be at some point, um, you know, a neutral observer, so to speak, who's actually re doing periodic review um, somewhere in in those steps. Because I, yeah, you, you, like like Don said, at some point you need um, a, a different perspective. Yeah, there was even there was a another question that um, alluded to that at as well um, with with study teams and sponsor oversight. So there was a question if periodic review is delegated to your CRO or, you know, because you don't have inside resource and that makes sense. Um, you know, what is the expectation of the sponsor's involvement apart from reviewing and approving the reports? The question keeps popping. So, you know, Again, sponsor oversight, and that, that's always a tough one, but they, we do want to see evidence of sponsor, and I'm thinking more from the inspection and auditor standpoint. We want to see, we want to see evidence of that sponsor oversight. You know, if that sponsor oversight is reviewing the reports and commenting on the reports, signing off on the reports, uh, that, that, is, that is showing evidence of sponsor oversight. Do they have to go in? And also review the documents if you've outsourced that necessarily. But you know, I I don't think it hurts to go and spot check here and there and show that you've done that. You know, so how you show your oversight, again, completely up to you. Um, but show it. Make sure that you you have it documented that, you know, if you're looking at the report, that's fine. If you're looking at overall listings from the TMF, that's probably fine as well since you've outsourced it. 
but you know make sure that you're you're showing that you're doing something and nothing not nothing i know a lot of sponsors that they get their tmf back from their cro at the end and they get surprises I'm like well, wait a minute why are all these documents missing why isn't this here you know you don't want to be in that situation because at that point it's probably too late all right um Richard, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, if I could um, just add just briefly, I think um, part of the answer to that question depends on what the relationship is between the CRO and the sponsor. Do, is it a situation where the TMF is an interactive process, you know, where the the sponsor is sending the CRO documents on a regular basis and there's discussion and feedback about those documents as they're being uploaded? Or, or is it just like a document dump where you say, okay, once a month or every couple months, we're just going to dump a bunch of documents. So we do you upload them and then we'll take a look at them whenever, you know, probably at the end of the study. So I think the latter scenario is, you know, obviously probably not good for the sponsor because like you said, though, they can get all these surprises. But if there's an interactive process during the uploading and during those regular QC um, periods, then you, know, you should be able to avoid those surprises. Um, every contractual relationship is different. Um, in an ideal world, all CROs and sponsors would have the first scenario where it's an ongoing interactive process. But you know you can't guarantee that for everybody. True, but it, it's probably what you need to do. So I'm going to take just a couple more questions. We have about three minutes left, so I am conscious of time. Um, one of the questions is: It necessary to place finding results in the ETMF, or can it just be a list of documents that were reviewed and placed in the ETMF? You know, again, this is going to be dependent on your process. Um, there is some schools of thought that, oh, don't put all our findings in there because now we're letting the inspectors know where our issues are and, you know, writing up their reports for them. Um, I would actually disagree with that. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, where you put findings, well, I would say it in two ways. If you put findings in there, make sure you put remediations with it. So Findings without remediations can definitely be an issue because that's saying, I found a bunch of issues, but I didn't do anything about it. But if you put your remediations in there, it actually shows the health of your TMF process and the health of your quality system. And that will go a long way with inspectors. So, you know, I think it's fine to put your findings in there. If you at least have a list of documents and what your process was around those documents, that, that's the minimum. Um, and, and it's not wrong, but I, I don't always agree that that's the correct way. I think it's fine to put your findings in there. And I don't know, Richard, if you've seen anything different. Uh, Dawn, you took the words out of my mouth. I said, of course, you put findings, but you also put the remediations. Yeah. Um, there, there is, this is a little different from periodic review, but it, you're right about reviewing. Is it necessary to maintain an in-house file of the investigator file and the sponsor file um, because they, they require reviewing also? So um, I'm going to say to you, when you think about trial master file, and this is again a little outside of the purview of periodic review. Um, when you think about trial master file, everything that's sitting at the site in the investigator site file and your sponsor file is all TMF. The majority of documents that are in the ISF should already be in your sponsor TMF. But you don't, you know, I would be careful in maintaining duplicates of both and have to review both. Um, for the sponsor, ideally you have one TMF you have the documents from the site that can be in the sponsor TMF and everything else in there. So we're gonna vote, we're gonna, we actually need to wrap up here. So Richard, do you want any last words before we end the session? Oh, I just wanna thank everyone for attending and thank you for your questions. And yes, I hope that each and every one of us uh, has some kind of uh, regular periodic review in process and uh, be free to you know answer questions offline. Amazing. Just a quick thank you. Uh, just a reminder, we can continue the conversation. I know that there are still some questions. Don, you mentioned that you were going to be jumping into the networking sessions as well. 
So please uh, reach out to both Don and Richard in there. Our next, um, you know, after the networking break, we're going to be moving into our next session. Uh, that will be entitled Bear Traps and Honeypots, uh, Standardizing Document Management Approaches to Real World Studies, uh, hosted by Russell Joyce, Principal Consultant at Barrowcliff Consulting, and Stuart McCulley, founder of Phoenix. So it should be a, a continued action-packed day for uh, both. Uh, uh, just a, a sincere thank you again to both you, Richard, and Don, and uh, for everybody participating in the polls, the questions, uh, there's been lots of uh, outstanding comments that are coming through. So enjoy day four of TMF week, and we'll see you guys again soon. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.